Give it up for, we can say it, the legendary Kevin Conroy. Hey. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. Now, how fun is it to have that in your back pocket at all times? Isn't that cool? It is very cool. It, it helps when you're ordering Chinese food, you know. I was going to say, has there ever been a, a particularly fun moment or time where you've been able to bring out the voice? Maybe like a drive through or telemarketer or anything? I'm not allowed to. It's like a, it's like a weapon, you know? Yeah. You can't, you can't use it. Now, for you, getting into the character, when you, when you step into the booth, I know everyone has a, it's kind of fun to talk about the process for people. Sometimes it's different, people have a different way of approaching it. What, what is it for you? How do you really you know, step inside the character? You know, acting, actors always have, some people call it a hook into the role, uh, something that kind of gets you into the character. And I found, for me, the hook into uh, Batman Bruce Wayne was um, that moment when he witnessed his parents murdered. That's what totally traumatized him. And the only way he could cope with that tragedy was to become this other being. And to the point where, and th this, was a, this was a really uh, important thing for me to discover along the way, to the point where Batman isn't the disguise. Batman is who he really became. And in order to disguise himself in the world, he puts on a three-piece suit. He goes to the office. He's charming. He's Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne's the disguise. And so if you play it that way, then when you do the Batman voice, it doesn't sound like you're putting on a weird voice. And some actors, it always sounds weird when they do the voice. And I think I kept it grounded in reality by, by making Bruce Wayne the performance. Oh. So that was kind of my hook into the role. Wow. And having the, the success that you've had in these roles on, on the voice side and you know, being an actor and maybe not having that recognizability because people they hear your voice but they may not know you to see you, is that a blessing or, or a curse as an actor? It was a totally anonymous job for a long time, which I was fine with, you yeah. know? No one knew what I did, it was great. And then slowly, yeah. people started, I started hearing my name, people started recognizing, I think it has to do with the internet and the fact yeah. that you can, you know. It's true. You know, Google anybody and find out who they are. I was, I, I live in New York, I'm a native New Yorker, and um, I was crossing Broadway and I hear this against the light, of course, as all New Yorkers do, and I hear this cop car pulling me over, and I thought, you have got to be kidding me. No one gets busted for jaywalking in New York. This is so unfair. And then I hear over the speaker, over the cop car, Batman, pull over. <laughs> and I smiled at him, I said, how did you know? He said, everybody knows who's Batman. <laughs> he said, we want our picture with you. <laughs> I said, I thought you were gonna bust me from jaywalking. He said, no, no, this is New York. No one gets busted for jaywalking. <laughs> <laughs> so being with the character for so long, how, how has Batman become a part of your life at this point? Is it, is it really kind of fused with, with the real Kevin Conroy? No, 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 I don't like, you know. You don't sleep I in don't a cave? I don't sleep in a cave. No, no okay. Um, the, the trick over, it's, you know, it's been 27 years. It's yeah. going on 28 years. Isn't that wild? It's like all my actor friends hate me. <laughs> hate me. Um, the, when you, I, I'm, a, I'm a theater uh, actor originally. I trained at Juilliard. I did a lot, a lot of work for Joe Papp at The Public and on Broadway. So that was my home. And part of the trick of acting on the stage isn't just discovering the role. That's hard enough. But then you have to figure out how to do it eight times a week. And each night making it seem brand new. 
And then you've got to figure out how to do it for a year, eight times a week, and each night to make it seem brand new. So there are different ways you figure out of not like, they call it not playing the result. You, you play the, the, the journey the character goes through and you let the result speak for itself. And that way it's always very spontaneous. Um, so for me, part of the trick in doing Batman for so many years was keeping him fresh, keeping it new. Um, people say, how did he evolve over the years? And I'm like, well, he really didn't evolve. It was more, the, the trick was really keeping it fresh. And, um, and I know I did that because I just did uh, um, the Harley Quinn movie with, uh, with Bruce Timm. And, and uh, Bruce and I hadn't worked with each other in, in a little while. And he said, he said, don't you age? He said, your voice sounds exactly the way it did 27 years ago. This is weird. And I said, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, had, had you been you know, on camera wearing the suit, you might not have been able to play the roles that, that long, which is kind of a blessing in a I way know. you can live this character for so many years. I know, it's been, yeah, it's been really a blessing. It really has. Now, going back to the beginning when you first auditioned, or that was even was it an audition? Like, how did you how did you end up landing? It was a this? cold audition. I was a New York actor who happened to be in L.A. doing a pilot for a series. I had a voiceover agent who handled me for commercial voiceovers, because in the, in the theater in New York, one way of subsidizing your stage income is to do commercial voiceovers, because Madison Avenue's in New York, and all the commercials are are done there, but. Um, all the animated shows are done in LA. So I had never done any animated voiceovers. So this same voiceover agent said, you know, they're doing a new show over at Warner Brothers. Why don't you go over and give it a shot? It's Batman. And I said, new show? I said, I, I grew up on Batman. Batman's been around forever. I didn't even know it had never been an animated show. That's how naive I was. And, um, and so I went in and I met Bruce Timm and Eric Radomski and Andrea Romano. You know, it's like the gold standard of people working in animation. And I think my naivety fed into the fact that I got the role because I wasn't at all intimidated by who I was dealing with. I didn't know these were important people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and Bruce said, well, what's your background with Batman? I said, well, I know the Adam West show. And he said, no, no, no. <laughs> we love Adam. We love Adam, but that's not what we're doing. He said, uh, that was campy. This is like film noir. This is serious. This is, don't you know the Batman legacy? What kind of childhood did you have? And um, so he brought me up to speed. And uh, I think just, it was just a cold audition. Hmm. And I went in the booth and I said, well, let, let me just use my imagination. And I think the fact that I, well, I was just talking to someone about this yesterday, the fact that my background was in really classic theater. I went to Juilliard, so I did a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of the Greeks. And of all the superheroes, Batman doesn't have any superpowers. It's his passion that drives him and his sense of morality He's like one of those classic heroes. He's like Orestes. He's Achilles. Uh, you know what I mean? He's, my background, oddly enough, was perfect for what they were looking for. They were looking for someone to play a classic, dark hero role. And, and someone who wouldn't do it in a cartoony voice. So I thought, well, this is Hamlet. This is Orestes. I'll just, you know, and I went in and I got into this place in my head and, and I just, I played it the way I would do a stage, you know, um, uh, performance. And uh, they hired me on the spot. They'd seen over 500 people. Wow. And um, I th it's just, it was just a lucky day. I just happened to be the right actor at the right time for the right role. Yeah. It was just a unique set of circumstances. You know, the... Angels were, yeah. were guiding us all. It was just a lucky day. I think, and was, yeah, that's not what I'm speaking <laughs> myself. We wouldn't have it any other way, right? 
Well, there are a ton of fans here today. I know there's a lot of uh, audience questions. We do have an aisle mic, which was in the aisle. I'll uh, move it over there later. Okay. So if you guys want to start to uh, line up maybe in that aisle, we'll put a mic in front of you if you have questions uh, for Kevin. Uh, until then, though, um, I know Mark Hamill did this recently where uh, he uh, read a, uh, he read some Trump tweets as, uh, as the Joker. <laughs> now. The thing with, 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 with some, some of Trump's tweets, you know, he talks about being powerful and, and rich and, you know, famous and very Bruce Wayne, okay? So I actually... No. Well, he's rich. No. He's powerful. No? Bruce Wayne would never brag about it. <laughs> All right. It's true. That is true. It's true. Okay. So I did, I did actually find a, a particular tweet uh, from Donald Trump. I was wondering if you could give us uh, maybe, maybe a bit of a Batman... Uh, Okay, this is uh, Batman doing Donald Trump. Oh man, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> Actually, throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been mental stability and being like, really smart. <laughs> Crooked Hillary also played these cards very hard and as everyone knows, went down in flames. I went from very successful businessman to top TV star to president of the United States on my first try. I think that would qualify as not smart, but genius. And a very stable genius at that. Give it up for Kevin Conroy, wow. That is that is amazing! Wow, wow, that that was uh, that was incredible. Well, thank you so much. Sure. It, it oddly kind of uh, fit for some reason. I don't know. Okay, well let's start with audience questions. So go ahead, sir. What is your question? Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what was what was your favorite Batman villain during the show? Villain? Yeah. Well, come on, Mark Hamill. I love Mark Hamill. He's, Mark, I wish you could see him in the booth. I wish all of you could see what he does. You know how Jim Carrey has that rubbery face that it just transforms? That's Mark. Mark gets in the booth and he's like, ooh, Betty. You know, and he's, he's like, ooh. Uh, and, and then there's all the spit that comes at me, you know, in the room. <laughs> and I, I leave the room and I'm like, thanks, Mark. That was great. <laughs> But he's like, he's, he's all over me. He's all over the microphone. He's so, he becomes the Joker. It's really wonderful to watch. He's, he's such a generous actor. He gives me so much. And he's, there's no bull with Mark. He's, he's very much there. He's there to do the work. He's there to, to have a fun time with the other actor. There's no attitude. Um, and I love a, a great example of this. Will this will tell you what I think of Mark? I just love him. He to watch him watch other actors work is wonderful. This is what I recently saw the other day when he was watching. I think it was Dietrich Bader uh, doing a voice in a thing. And this is Mark acro across the other side of the recording studio. <laughs> He looked like a, two, a 12 year old looking in a candy store. He was just so enjoying the other actor's work. And I just stared at him and I laughed. I thought, that's Mark. Um, he's a very, very generous guy. And you know, acting is more about reacting. You, you give what you get, just like in life. You, if you get a, a wonderful, performance from the other actor, it just draws it out of you. You just, you have so much more to respond to. So that's why um, so much of the success of all the Batman shows was Andrea Romano, who was the casting director. She, she had a wonderful talent of finding not just talented actors, but talented actors who had a big heart and who would come into the room to play and wouldn't bring their ego in with them. You know, actors are people. There are generous ones and selfish ones and egotistical ones and shy ones. You know, they're just all kinds. And she had a really wonderful way of, of 
weeding out the jerks so that the performances were always, bookings, word got out pretty quickly around LA that these bookings were going on once a week at Warner Brothers, this is back in the 90s, and everyone wanted to get in on these because they said there's a lot of fun going on over there. Um, so she said she could get any actor she wanted eventually to come in. It's interesting is I think uh, I know with some shows it's individual ca sessions that they record. Well, the other studios it. tend to like individual records because then in the post production they have a clean take, yeah. so there's there's no problem with overlapping or anything like that, and they have a, a very clean take. Yeah. Warner Brothers really likes to get the actors together, That's and great. I think it just gets a much better performance out of people, wow. um, and, and but it, but it makes their post production harder. But you see the results. I mean, you, oh, get, you get these wonderful performances. Yeah, and with Mark Hamill, he's now the voice of Chucky in the new reboot. Yeah. So I think it fits really well that he went from Joker to now playing a sadistic little doll that's going to kill everybody. Yeah, I know. So moving on up. OK, let's go back to audience questions. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Conroy. Hi. Uh, you have become a true legend uh, and inspired millions of people around the world, especially children. When you were growing up, what inspired you? Was there anything or anyone that particularly inspired you to pursue the career that you're followed now? Wow. I kind of fell into it. I, oh boy. I went through Catholic schools and um, my family was very messed up. My father was an alcoholic, and um, I ended up leaving home when I was about 16. But um, when we moved uh, to a different town, there was no Catholic school, so I went into public schools when I was about 12. And I was a complete misfit. They didn't know what to do with me because I was used to incredible order and discipline. These are the, you know, I had the old fashioned Catholic schools with nuns and habits and clickers and, you know, it was very regimented, mass every morning, you know. Um, and suddenly I was in this public school, which was to me chaos and I could not figure out what was going on. So I was in the guidance counselor's office in the afternoon, They're like, what's the matter with this kid? And I said, this is the matter with me. The, the problem is with all the rest of them, you know, but, um, I was having a really hard time adjusting to the schoolwork too. And they had me in all of these like level D classes because they thought that there was something, I wasn't, I wasn't just functioning. And this English teacher, Joyce Wilkes, this is the power of one teacher when I was 12. Um, she assigned us to read Julius Caesar as a homework assignment. I'd never read a play before. I'd never seen a play before. And I was reading it and it just made sense to me. It was just, I just, it just made sense. So I came in the next day and she asked people to explain Brutus's speech or one of the speeches. I think it was Brutus's speech. I shot my hand up. She said, yes, Mr. Conroy. And I went on and on and on and on and I was so, and she'd never seen me talk like this before. She'd never seen all this coming in. She said, do you, you, really, you really had an experience with this play. I said, oh yeah, yeah, I really understood it and this was happening, that happening. She said, I want you to come in this afternoon and, um, and audition for the school play that we're putting together. And it was Our Town. Every junior high school does Our Town, right? So I auditioned for George Gibbs and I got the role. And the minute I walked on that junior high school stage, I felt so at home. I felt so comfortable. I felt safe. Other kids went on the stage and they had stage fright and panicked. I went on the stage and all my panic of being off stage melted away. And I felt so happy. And I thought, wow, this is where I belong. So Joyce Wilkes, one English teacher, and then she said to the school, she said, I suggest we put this kid in advanced placement courses, all of his courses, just to see what happens. And I ended up getting straight A's. And I ended up graduating high school a year early. Um, it was just, she saw something in me that everyone else was missing. That's how important teachers are. But um, so that's how I got into theater. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. What is your question? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, is there any, 
Sorry. Is there any Batman story that has yet to be adapted to like TV or film that you personally think would be an interesting project for yourself? A Death in the Family. Yeah. How awesome would that be? It didn't take me long to think about that. Because I also wanted to do Hush, and they did it without me. So, yeah, there, there, are, there are great stories that haven't been done yet. Great. I like how your mind just got blown there. That was. Oh, dude, my mind's been blown all weekend by that, man. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> cool, thank you. <laughs> all right, sir, go ahead. What is your question? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, Kevin Carlin, you, you, you uh, I'm, I'm a little nervous. You uh, inspired me to do a lot of things. I, I was going through a tough time when I was a kid. I didn't really fit in. I didn't have, I wasn't the smartest kid, but watching Batman, it kind of empowered me to be something. That's wonderful. Like, that I could be. Like, like I could be, I could be more than people thought they, what they thought I could be. Sure. And what, and I, and I had mentors in my life too. And I was just wondering, I don't know if can I, can I bring this up? Is this a painful thing? Ephraim Zimbalist passed away a few years ago. Oh yeah. Yeah. And no, no, I, I mean, no, that's not painful. I he mean, was a... I, I'm sorry. I just want to say this. I mean this in the best way possible. When you were doing work with him, it seemed like you guys had like a father son yeah. relationship. Absolutely. Was that, was that like, was that what he was like, or was that something that, that you and him kind no, of... No, that was what he was like. He was, he was a very genuine, very genuine guy. And we just hit it off. Um, I had never met him before we did the show. Uh, I knew his daughter, Stephanie, yeah, yeah. from Juilliard. But really? I wasn't really close friends with her because she was in a different class. Uh -huh. but, um, but I knew her. We knew each other. But I, I had never met him. And... Um, he kind of took me under his wing. He was really old school Hollywood, professional gentleman. Uh, I can't, it's the same with Adam West. Um, really gentlemanly old school, wonderful uh, actors to work with. So yeah, I had a great relationship with him. But what you were saying about how it, how it helped you, it's so interesting. This, people ask me why it's resonated for so long, the shows. And I think it's because of stories like yours. Yeah. People who's, who had really rough childhoods, we don't realize how difficult a lot of people have it. Um, and, and sometimes the only safe zone is Batman, or is, or is, or is an animated show for and someone. Batman. And Batman Beyond. And, and yeah, and he's, well, him too, yeah. <laughs> and and he you. speaks to kids. I, had a, I, had, I was at a Chicago Comic Con, and a, young, a woman came up to me, and she said, I've always wanted to hug you. And I said, sure, let's give a hug. And she said, no, you don't understand. You helped save my life. And I said, come on. She said, no, no, no. I grew up in the projects on the south side of Chicago. And she said, most everyone I knew as a kid is either in prison or dead. But I had you babysitting me every afternoon. Because my parents were wonderful parents, but they were both working three jobs. You know, We were struggling. And you kept me off the street and, with a show. And the show taught me the difference between right and wrong. And I thought, wow, you know, we don't... When you're on this side of the microphone and you're doing the performance and just sending it out in the ether, you don't know how it touches people's lives. And, um, and then I hear stories like that, like yours, and like, like this woman in Chicago. And you realize you can really affect people. Um, f for the good, which is great. Awesome. What was your name? Uh, BJ. 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 Give it up for BJ. That was an amazing question. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, BJ. Hi. Hi. Howdy. So, uh, you know, uh, when I was growing up, Batman, the animated series, obviously struck me because it was so creative. So I watched it very religiously. And then when I was an adult, something else that grabbed me like that was the Venture Brothers. <laughs> So I was just wondering, how much Batman did you bring into the booth when you were doing Captain Sunshine? Captain Sunshine. <laughs> There's a funny story about Captain Sunshine. I, I shouldn't admit this. They, they sometimes book you to do jobs, and if you're really busy, you don't necessarily read the script. You read the breakdown, and you think, oh, great, sounds great. I'll just, oh, it's sort of a superhero, great. Okay, I'll be right there. And they record that in New York. And I live in New York, so I thought, oh, this will be easy. I'll just shoot down and 
do a little recording. It'll be, I'll be in and out, half an hour, great. So I get there, and they give me the script in the waiting room, and I was there a little early, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> he really likes Robin. <laughs> He really likes Robin. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't do this. <laughs> Warner Brothers is gonna kill me if I do this. But I've already, this is the booking, I'm here. But I was like 15 minutes early. So I said to the secretary, um, I've gotta put some more money in the meter. Uh, I'll be right back. And I ran, she looked at me because no one drives cars in New York, you know? But I said, I'll be right back. So I run downstairs to the street and I'm walking along like 43rd Street or something and I thought, I can't do this show, I can't do this show. Warner Brothers is gonna kill me if I do this show. And then I thought, damn it, Kevin, you're an actor. It's a, it's a funny role, it's a great role, you can do it. And I turn around and I start walking back to the building and then I thought, no, they're gonna kill me at Warner Brothers. So I start walking back towards Penn Station and I thought, damn it, you're an actor, going back. So I was going back and forth, back. I thought, finally, screw it, I'm doing it. So I go up in the elevator, I get to the floor, the doors open, and there are the producers of the show standing there and one of them says to the other, you owe me 20 bucks. <laughs> They had been watching me on the street. <laughs> and they were laying bets. Is he gonna do it? Is he not gonna do it? Oh, there, we lost him. Oh, we got him again. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's great. That's great. All right, go ahead, what is your question? All right, my name is Brandon. It's been an absolute honor to meet you this weekend, sir. You, like I told you at your booth earlier today, you have been my idol and hero since I was a kid. With that being said, my favorite feature that you have done and did Batman in was Justice League Doom. So I am curious, what has your favorite feature been other than the TV show that we all know and love you for? What has been your favorite Batman feature film that you voiced over? Well, that's a good question because I think they've all been really amazing. I loved Sub-Zero because of the, the performance of Michael Ancero was just incredible. It's such a to watch him mourn his Nora, you know, I mean, just such a heartfelt performance. Um, but my, I have a, a special place for Mask of the Phantasm because it was the yes. first movie. Yes! It was the first movie, and also it tells the whole Batman legacy. You know, you, you, you get the whole backstory because, and, and I love that moment when he, he, um, well, for those of you who don't know, he falls in love with this woman named Andrea Beaumont. And Batman doesn't love. That's the only way he's able to remain so isolated is if he's a completely isolated individual. And he suddenly realizes, oh, this is what life's about. It's about sharing with someone. It's not about living alone in a cave. It's like a, a massive re revelation to him. But he realizes in order to live that way, he's gonna to have to be released from his vow to his parents. So he goes to his parents' grave and he's pleading with them. It's a very emotional scene to please release him, to please let him go. And just as in the, is in the, in the midst of this, whoosh, this flock of bats comes screaming up out of a cave and pulls him back down into his fate and he knows he can't lead a normal life. It's, it's really, it's, it's like Edgar Allan Poe, you know, it's just like, it's so, it's great. Thank you very much, sir, sure. for answering that question. And thank you, I'm sure, on behalf of everybody here for everything you have given us. Louis, we, we all love you very, thank very, you. very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Hi, I have a comment and a question. Comment, I feel you're the best voice for Batman and Mark Hamill was the best Joker. Yeah, Together Mark you guys made a great pair. Thank you. And my question is, was there a piece of advice throughout your career that really stuck with you to this day? Yes. <laughs> I've had some really interesting advice that comes from very unlikely places. My gra I, had, I had Irish grandparents, all four of them came over on the boat. 
and one of them was a real character, and she used to say, always listen very carefully to what someone's telling you in the first five minutes when you meet them, because they're usually telling you exactly who they are, which was so smart. But so if you're listening to what people say, you can get real wisdom from different places. I, um, I had just gotten out of Juilliard. I was playing Edgar in King Lear, which is the Mad Tom character. Half the play he's disguised as a, as a homeless man. So I was like scavenging around the stage. And John Hauseman had directed the production and it was opening on Broadway. And this is my first New York show. And I, you know, I'm 21 at this point. I'd been supporting myself since I was like 17 on scholarships and waiting tables. So I had no alternative. I had no back door. You know, this was all the eggs were in this basket. And my first review in the New York papers comes out and I was alone in the theater. Everyone had gone to Sardi's for the opening night party. And it says, Kevin Conroy's Edgar is like watching a crab twitching on hot sand. <laughs> it's a bad review. And I just thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? I, I've been slammed and I don't know how to do anything else. I didn't go to a regular college. What am I going to do? This is all I can do. And I was sitting there and everyone else had left. I thought I was alone backstage and I hear from the doorway, John Hauseman's booming voice. Do you know who he was from the paper chase? He's very British and very old, old world. Every once in a while in a man's life, there comes a moment when he has to put one foot in front of the other and get on with the business of living. I suspect you've arrived at such a moment. One foot in front of the other, get out of here and have some fun. I thought that was very, very good advice. So that was some good advice I got. Okay. And then another time I was, I was working with an actor who was known as the Duchess of Bedford because he was such a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> His name was Brian Bedford. He was a genius, a wonderful actor, but also very difficult. And he met my father, whom I was estranged from for many years. And my father came to see us open uh, in Boston. I was doing Death Trap. I was co-starring with Brian. So it was a big, you know, Broadway tour. And my father came backstage and Brian saw me freak out, saw me change. And the next night he pulled me aside and he said, your father is a very difficult man, isn't he? I said, well, that's putting it nicely. Yeah, I said, he's a... He's an angry drunk. He said, and my father was much older. He was born in 1910. So it was like having a grandfather. So he was much older at this point. And he said, um, someday very soon, your father's going to pass. And you don't want him to be haunting you for the rest of your life. So my advice to you is do everything you can to mend that relationship while he's still alive. And I took that advice to heart and I ended up taking care of my father um, for his final years and, and I was holding him the night he died. And um, I am so appreciative for that bit of advice from the Duchess of Bedford. <laughs> so, you know, you get advice from all these different places. Thank you. We have time for just a couple more questions, so go ahead. What is your question? Hi, Kevin. Um, Hi. My name is Sean. I just wanted to say, you know, the animated series, all the movies and everything, but, you know, something that I've played and replayed over and over again is the Arkham series. Oh, you man. I appreciate that. Um, great gameplay and obviously great performances by you and Mark. Um, my question is just, besides any character you've already played, Marvel or DC, who would you want to play besides Batman if you had your dream? Oh, I started with the most cool character. 
Where do you go after Batman? Only down. Down. <laughs> um, Wolverine would be a cool character yeah. to play. Yeah. That'd be fun. Uh, Joker. I'd love to do Joker. But I couldn't ever do it the way Mark does it. Um, but it's interesting you bring up the games. Let me just tell you a bit about doing the games. Doing the shows, they have all of us together in a booth. You're with six, eight, ten other actors, whatever it is. And you do it like a radio play. And it's fun, and it's in two hours. You record a half an hour show. You're home, you're done, that's it. The games, Arkham Knight, the third of the series, took two years to build. There are 37,000 lines of dialogue that were recorded for it. And you go in, and because of the way they're built, the, the, the way they're structured, they have to have completely clean takes. So they can't have any other actors in there with you. So you have to be alone. So you're in a booth alone for four hours at a time, then you get an hour for lunch, and then it's another four hour block. A week, for a week, doing line after line after line after line after line after line after line. Oh, you know, get out. Get out. Get out. That was great, Kevin. Now could you do it with a little irony? <laughs> Get out. Get out. Get out. We love the irony. Now could you give it a smile? Get out. Like that? Get out. Yeah, that's great. Now, okay, now like you really want to kill them. Get out! Okay, now do it like that, but with the irony. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You think I'm making this up? Oh, well, we believe you. For 37,000 lines. <laughs> and you're trying to keep the Batman character alive without Mark Hamill there to feed you anything. You know, you're all alone in this vacuum, keeping the character alive. And then each line is done in a back. And, you know, they have to describe to you what's happening. Okay, now the Joker's, you know, chasing you down the street of Arkham and he's just kicked you. And then, and then you say, get out, you know. <coughs> It's maddening. And you do that for a week, and then they go off and they write some more, and then they bring you in for another week. And Arkham Knight took two years to put together that one game. That's why those games don't come out so frequently, because they cost a fortune to build. They take a lot to build, a lot of time. But then they make, Arkham Knight make it made a billion dollars. Uh, they make more from those than they do from feature films now, the studios. But they're just very, very complicated to put together. And, and as an actor, you know, they can't teach you at Juilliard how to, you know, get out. You know, they, how to do a line a hundred different ways on a dime without anyone else feeding you anything. It's just crazy. It's crazy. All right. Well, thank you so much. I have time for one more question. So go ahead. What is your, what so is your question? Me. My name is Justine. Hi. Thank you for being the cheapest babysitter my husband and I ever hired. You're welcome. The check is in the mail. Thank you. Um, thank God he's 30 now and on his own. <laughs> um, my favorite episode, I've got Batman in the basement. What's uh -huh. yours? I love any episode that explores Batman's psychology. Um, just f from an actor's point of view, it makes it fun and challenging. So I really love Perchance to Dream. Yes. Um, I, I was Batman Bruce Wayne, then I was drugged Batman, then I was adolescent Bruce Wayne, and then I was Thomas Wayne, the father. So there were five different voices that had to be distinct, but related. Um, it was, it, it's a really complicated story, and I love that one. I love... Um, uh, Legends of the Dark Knight, the one where they do all the different artistic imp you know, renderings of Batman. Um, I love the ones that get into the psychology of him because he's so complicated. That's what audience loves about him and that's what I love about playing him. He's so, he's a man with issues, as Bruce Tim likes to say. But the children, that's, that's what does it. His interaction with the children as well. So the children that are growing up with you, uh -huh. 
will relate and have a better understanding and see that things can be hopeful. Oh, yeah. Productive. So underdwellers, too. Oh, I mean, underdwellers, yeah. Kids. I'm all about the kids. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Amazing. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, make some noise for Mr. Kevin Conroy. Thank you so much. Thank you.